Raquel Yubi. I am co-founder and chief science and strategy officer of an MIT spin-off called Affectiva. And we are all about bringing emotional intelligence to our digital experiences and our digital world. So when I first started studying emotions more than 15 years ago, emotions were really on the fringe. People didn't understand them. They thought they got in the way. Um, but since then, there's been a ton of literature showing that emotions organize rather than disrupt our rational thinking. And in fact, our emotions influence every aspect of our lives. Think about it. Emotions influence our stress, our health and well-being, how we learn, um, how we connect and communicate with each other. It's called empathy. And also how we make decisions. Could be big decisions, like who you're going to marry or where you're going to live, but also very small ones, like what you're going to have for breakfast. And it's only maybe in the past year or so that there's been a lot of conversation around emotions. I mean, if you look in the press, there's always something about how emotions drive consumer experience or user experience or design, or even the empathy economy, how people connect and communicate with each other in a digital world. But we feel there's a problem. We're increasingly connected by more and more devices. In the US, on average, every adult has about four connected devices, and the number's only going to increase. There's expected to be about 26 billion um, smart devices by the year 2020. But all these devices are missing emotions. They're missing emotional intelligence. We like to say our devices have high IQ, but no EQ. Except in the movies, that is. <laughs> um, my favorite two examples are actually Her, the movie, and Ex Machina. How many people have seen either? Awesome. So what I find fascinating about these two movies is that in, in both cases, the machines, so in Her, it's Samantha, the operating system, and in Ex Machina, it's the robot, right? In both cases, um, these machines are very, they're highly, highly, highly smart, but they're highly, highly emotionally intelligent. And because they're emotionally intelligent, they're able to get these guys to like them, persuade them, motivate them to take actions that they wouldn't have otherwise. And then, of course, the movies take dark turns, but we'll forget about that piece. <laughs> um, but it's been shown over and over, the humans, the humans that have high EQ, they are more persuasive. They have more successful lives. And interestingly enough, this translates to the machine world as well. And so my career has really been about asking, what if our devices, what if our technology could sense and then adapt to our emotions? So as humans, we express and communicate emotions in a wide number of ways. We use gestures, we use our voice, um, and of course, we use our face. So our face happens to be one of the most powerful ways of connecting and expressing emotion. Everything from joy, confusion, surprise, concern, um, empathy, and even anger, of course. And the science of the facial expressions of emotion has been around for over 200 years. When it first started, this guy called Duchenne, he would study the face by electrically stimulating facial muscles. So that was pretty painful. We don't do that anymore. Um, but in the last 30 years, um, this guy called Ek Paul Ekman and his research team published what we call the facial action coding system. And to simplify it, it takes every facial muscle and it converts it to an action unit. So for example, action unit 12 is the lip corner pull. So try it, everybody. So it's a smile, right? Um, action unit four is the brow furrow. Again, let's try that. That's the corrugator muscle. And it's an indication of like dislike or confusion. And it takes about 100 hours to become a certified face coder. And then about maybe five minutes to every minute of video to code exactly what's happening on the face. So it's a very laborious, not scalable, time-consuming exercise. So what we've done is we've developed algorithms using machine learning and computer vision that automate this process. And the best way to demonstrate this is to do a live demo. So I'd like a volunteer, somebody ideally with a face. <laughs> Come on. All right, awesome. Um, this app is also available on the App Store and um, the Android um, Play Store as well. Up on stage. So you can download it and play with it. Can we switch to the iPad, please? 
I'm Rana. Rodrigo. Rodrigo. Awesome. So if you stand over here, I'll give you the iPad. Let's see if we can see your face. Maybe. Oh, is it not connected? I think it is. Hmm. <laughs> We're going to get this to work. We literally tested it like five minutes before. Do you think the... Plug it in, plug it back again. Hmm. You know what we could do, actually, while we get this working? What if you stand here, and okay. then people might see what's happening, and I'll talk, you, talk people through okay. it. Um, I don't know if, can anybody see what's going on here? Like yeah, so basically, so basically what's happening is um, the algorithm found, oh, yay, okay. uh, thank you. <laughs> All right. All right, so basically what's happening here is the algorithm has found Rodrigo's face, so that's the white bounding box, and then it's locked onto his facial features, like his eyes, his feet, his eyebrows, his mouth. And then it's going to map all the different movements he's going to do on his face to a number of expressions. So let's test this. So if you smile, you can see the smile oh, being recognized. <laughs> Brow furrow? Like this. Hmm. Yeah, good job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was a genuine yeah, smile, that one. Um, eyebrow raise, like an expression right. of surprise. Yep. And the lip, <laughs> lip <laughs> What's a lip pucker? I don't know. A what lip that pucker is. is the duck face, like the Kardashians. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then it maps these different facial expressions to a number of emotional states, like joy or surprise or disgust. Yeah, give me a disgusted face. I tried, but it, it doesn't score very high. Try again. Like wrinkle what's your what's nose. Balance? So valence is how positive or negative an experience is. So oh, if okay. you look positive. It's, no. it's going to be a positive number. If you look like angry or surprised, yeah, or sad. Um, awesome. And then hang on a second. Okay. So one of the ways we, we use this technology is we understand how people respond to an online experience, for example, an online video. So I'm going to watch you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to have you watch a short clip. Okay. And the computer's going to watch you watch the short clip. Here we go. All right, open. Hmm, this looks new. Make it safe. What is it? Uh, Okay, caution. There is a dangerous smell, people. Hold on, what is that? This is disgust. She basically keeps Riley from being poisoned, physically and socially. That is not brightly colored or shaped like a dinosaur. Hold on, guys. It's broccoli! <laughs> yeah! Well, I just saved our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're welcome. Riley, if you don't eat your dinner, you're not gonna get any dessert. Wait, did he just say we couldn't have dessert? That's anger. He cares very deeply about things being fair. So that's how you want to play it, old man? No dessert? Oh, sure. We'll eat our dinner right after you eat this. Ah! Right, right. Here comes an airplane. Ah! Oh, airplane. We got an airplane, everybody. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So you can see... Yeah, you can see the exact moments where he smiled or engaged with the content. And we call this, like, res compared to everybody else that's seen this clip, you were medium engaged. We've yeah, seen I people saw, saw before, already, that's yeah, why. So Anyways, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Okay, All right, clap, clap, clap. <laughs> can we switch back? So how do you train a computer to read these types of facial expressions? I like to give the example of the smile and the smirk because they both involve the, the lower part of the face, the mouth. But one is pretty positive, the smile, of course, and one is quite negative, like in this example. So we give the computer tens of thousands of examples of each type of expression, and it's really critical that this is sourced from across the world, all, all sorts of cultures and ethnicities, genders, and ages. And then the computer extracts these features, um, you know, the textures on the face, the shape, the movement, and it maps it into, a pat into common patterns that are, um, that, you know, that are common across these different facial expressions. We use computer vision, machine learning, and deep learning, and we have amassed about 12 billion emotion data points that we use in our training data set. 
And we've been able to show that data really matters. The more data we throw at this algorithm, um, in smart ways, of course, the, the better performing it is. And what I find really exciting about this work is for the first time, we're able to capture our visceral, you know, subconscious emotion responses, and we can do that at scale. You know, you can ask people through a survey, how are you feeling today? Um, but it's hard. It's, it's hard for people to quantify exactly how they're feeling. Like, is my six like your six? And is my six even consistent across experiences? Um, or you could bring them into a lab and you can stick all sorts of, like, you know, sensors on their brain and whatever, but that's not very scalable. By leveraging our optical sensors or cameras that are pretty much everywhere, we're able to detect and capture this data pretty much anywhere, anytime, and that's very exciting. So how, how is this technology being used? And I'd like to say there's two main ways. One is to derive insights and analytics, so it's a big data play. I'll give some examples of that. And the other, which I believe is more exciting, is to drive real-time experiences. So you detect the emotion, and then you're able to adapt the experience in real time. And I'll give a few examples of that as well. And this kind of emotion sensing technology is applied through a number of industries. We've seen an example around media and advertising, but also automotives, healthcare, online learning, and a lot of other areas as well. So when I first started work in this space, I had access to about maybe 100 facial videos to train my algorithms, and they were mostly undergrads that we coerced to, uh, to share their data with us. We have now amassed over 3.5 million face videos from over 75 countries around the world, and it is, it's very spontaneous data. It's people at their homes watching, you know, watching or engaging with digital content. We ask, of course, for their permission. It's always, always opt-in. And if they agree, we are able to get this data. So that's about you know, 14,000 um, media units that we've tested, mo mostly advertisements, but other types of media as well. And all that culminates to 12 billion emotion data points. It's data that we've never had before. In media and advertising, we measure how people engage with content. I'll show you a quick example. Can we play the video, please? So here you'll see people responding to an ad, and then you'll also see exactly how um, the, the group response is doing. When I wake up, well, I know I'm gonna be young. I'm gonna be the man who wakes up next to you. And when I go out, yeah, I know I'm gonna be I'm gonna be the man who goes along with you. I don't know if you can see the faces. Some people are actually tearing up. It's pretty amazing the types of expressions that we see people emote. We're able to detect that response, as you can see, the, high, you know, the climax of the ad is towards the end. Now, we found in our work... <laughs> we found in our work that an emotionally engaged consumer, an emotionally engaged user, um, really does translate to an engaged, you know, a loyal kind of um, um, buyer or purchaser, if you like. So, for example, um, you, know, you see this trend that you, we saw throughout the ad? So if we see this consistently over an ad response, that ad is four times as likely to drive purchase behavior. It's also um, twice as likely to drive virality, um, this, you know, this ability or, or propensity to share an ad. We've also been able to take all this data and do amazing data mining exercises on this. So here you're seeing the enjoyment, you know, by vertical, by industry. So in the US, the pet care and baby care ads tend to be, um, tend to elicit the most enjoyment. They're, they're funniest. Whereas prescription and fuel ads, boring. <laughs> I think we kind of know that. Um, in, the, in Canada, though, it's different. It's the cereal ads that elicit the most enjoyment. Um, go figure. I should have done Ireland. <laughs> um, women are more expressive than men, not surprising. Um, but what is surprising is that this varies, the amount of difference varies by culture. So in the US, women um, smile 40% more than men. 
in France and Germany, it's only 25% more, and in the UK, um, there is no significant difference between men and women. If you have an explanation, please let us know, because we don't know why. <laughs> um, older people are more emotive than younger people. Perhaps they're less, um, you know, they, they, less wor they worry less about how people perceive them, maybe. We, again, we kind of have the data, we don't have the explanations yet, but it's fascinating to start seeing these trends and see how they're consistent across cultures as well. We've also looked at how your facial, just your facial expressions predict voting behaviors, who you vote for. We've done this for the Obama-Romney um, debates um, a few years ago, and you know, we're interested in repeating them in this round of, of uh, you know, presidential elections as well. Now, switching gears to real-time emotion interaction, we realize pretty quickly that as a team, there's no way on earth we're going to... I mean, we, we go to dinner parties and people are always like, oh, did you think about using your technology in a dating app? And I'm like, yes, but you know, we're not going to get around to it. So eventually, we packaged our core emotion engine as a software development kit. We've made it available across you know, different platforms, and we want people to go out and be creative and be innovative with this type of technology. I'll give you a few examples. Chubble is a live streaming app. It's like Periscope and Meerkat, only it integrates your emotional responses in real time. So if I'm chubbling from here to my friends in Boston, um, I can get to see their real time emotion responses. And I think that has the power to transform live streaming and broadcasting experiences and, and virtual reality as well. Wildflower is a meditation app. Um, it's a mindfulness meditation app, and they've integrated our technology to give you a sense of how well you're doing. Um, it's kind of a biofeedback kind of application. Um, and I see this broadening to um, mood tracking, where you're able to leverage technology to track your mood around the clock. Think of it as, you know, we, we, we see a lot of benefit from physical fitness tracking, um, but, but if you think of wellness, emotions and your emotional state and emotional health plays a very important piece of this. I'm particularly passionate about the application of this to mental health disorders, specifically around depression and anxiety. I feel like a lot of people who, um, you know, who have depression hide behind technology, and I feel like technology could be part of the solution. Um, online learning is another cool example of this type of technology. This is my daughter. Um, she, gave, she gave her consent to be, uh, to be recorded while doing Khan Academy, which is a math kind of a math online program. And you can see the range of emotions that she's expressing as well. Like, you know, when she goofs up, she smiles or she's surprised. Um, she's, she's, you know, she's concentrating or thinking a lot. And you can take this data and adapt the learning experience in real time. This is a neat example. It's, it's more of a brick and mortar type of example. It's called, um, it was a collaboration with Wild Blue Tech and Hershey, and it's called the Smile Sampler. So you walk up to this kiosk and it asks you to engage with it. If you do and you smile, you get a chocolate <laughs> sample. It's pretty neat. Two Car LED, um, they ran, a, um, I think, about eight concerts over the summer um, on the West Coast, and they had about 70,000 LEDs that were powered by your selfies. So you submitted a selfie, they used our technology to assess what the emotion was, and then that kind of drove the lights um, in this experience. Again, not just digital, but it's this, you know, this digital hybrid um, physical experience. And then, of course, if we project forward a little bit, Imagine when we all have social robots that are, you know, surrounding us at work and at home. These social robots need to be social. They need to have social and emotional intelligence skills. Um, and I want to show you a video where we um, hacked the droid BB-8 um, robot. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, we've, we basically made it emotion aware, so I'll show you a little video. So when you smile, the robot comes to you. <laughs> and if you look angry, it just runs away. <laughs> so this particular robot does not have cameras in its eyes, so we're driving it with, with a mobile phone. Um, but we are working with other robots that actually have um, you know, sensing capabilities. So 
once again, you can, you can imagine the applications of this type of technology within robotics, where the robot can sense that you're upset with it, maybe it'll apologize, or you know, that you're intrigued, and so it can, it, can, it can go on. And that's very critical when you're building rapport um, be, be, between a, a robot and a human being. And again, it's back to this idea of the robot being persuasive. So if you're using this robot as a learning companion, or maybe, um, you know, to, to help you with weight loss or to become healthier, the robot needs to really build this rapport with its user. The impetus of my work started by developing wearable devices for autism. We kind of um, prototyped something that looked like Google Glass and autistic kids were able to use it to understand the expressions of people they're interacting with. It is really amazing to see um, some of our app developers use this technology for exactly that use case. Um, and we're, you know, I think that has a lot of potential. And then ultimately, we see a world where pretty much like all our devices have GPS chips in them. And when they first came out, people were like, oh, we're never going to turn it on. Like, I don't want people to know where I am. But pretty much now, because we're getting enough value out of it, we do use location-enabled services. I see a world where our devices have an emotion chip. It could be our phone. It could be our car. Maybe it's our fridge, you know, sensing that we're stressed and kind of locking down and not allowing us to eat, you know, binge on chocolate or ice cream. <laughs> I would, I, I'd like that. Uh, <laughs> um, and ultimately, I believe that emotion-aware devices and technology can really transform the way we connect with our machines, but also ultimately how we connect and communicate with one another. Thank you so much. I think, do we have time for a few questions? Great. Please put your hand up if you have a question. Here we go. Uh, thank you so much for the beautiful talk. Can you uh, say a few words how your product compares to the solutions of Emotion? Of Emotion? Mm -hmm. Um, that's a great question. So we have, um, Emotion doesn't have a data repository, so we have more data, um, you know, we, we're, so, and we're able to mine and include that data in how we train and, you know, validate our algorithms. Um, we also have a mobile solution. They don't have one yet. But I have the utmost res respect for them, and I think this is a great, huge space to be in, and it's exciting to have, you know, other players like them. Here we go. Other questions? Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Julian. Uh, how do you validate the correctness of your algorithms? Do you use labeled data or do you cluster the data and then try to classify it? That's a great question. Um, we do have a team of fax certified coders that basically go, you know, their job every day is to label these videos and that's what we use for both training and validation. We've increasingly started doing like just, you know, unsupervised clustering of the, of the data as well, and we're finding really interesting results. Like, for example, we're finding there are different types of smiles. It's not just like smiles come in many flavors. Um, yeah, or we do both. We have to leave there. Rana, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>